get started with announcing because it's uh, time is marching on. So before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to just highlight to everyone that this is actually the first, the, the fun will be over after this talk. We're uh, very fortunate to have a whole lineup of really prominent HCI and visualization speakers come over the next two or three months. You can go to the Imager Lab website and look on the news list to get a highlight of who these people are and when they'll be coming. And I really uh, advise you to uh, take a look at that if you want to learn more about how HCI is uh, starting to really seep into so many different parts of our lives and driving the technological advances, not just fixing them. Uh, then, then these are a, a rare opportunity to see some of the big leaders in the field, uh, what they were thinking about right now, what they're working on. Okay, so uh, now, today, I'm very honored to be introducing Beth Minot. She's visiting us from Georgia Tech's College of Computing, where she's a full professor. And she's also the executive director of the Institute for People and Technology. Beth started out in the US South. She got her bachelor's from North Carolina State and her master's and PhD in computer science from Computer Tech. From there, she went on to Xerox Park and uh, in the Bay Area, and it was a fairly important time. She was also there at the same time that I was at Interval Research, so we were kind of overlapping. That's not the only reason it was an important time. <laughs> uh, and uh, she got to hang out with Mark Weiser, though, and I didn't. And then she went on to a faculty position at Georgia Tech in 1998. So uh, the list of things that Beth has contributed in her research is very long. A few of the highlights, uh, just to give you an idea of the, the broad scope of it, is ubiquitous computing, assistive technology, personal health informatics, and computer-supported collaborative work, as well as HCI. And uh, I also want to point out that Beth has, uh, a lot of us have encountered Beth in a different kind of role as well. And so I'll give some examples. She is on the Microsoft Researchers Technical Advisory Board. She's part of an NSF-sponsored effort to get computing researchers to go after more audacious research challenges. Uh, Disney Research has engaged her in similar kinds of roles. And I'm sure she can give a lot more examples. Maybe she will in this talk. And so what I'm trying to say is that Beth has spent a lot of time being an instrument of change as well as someone who does some very interesting research. And I think she might start by uh, saying a little bit about that. So uh, enjoy the talk and I'll turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Karen. I love that introduction. I'm going to keep that one uh, forever. Um, but uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. I've been here. Uh, I think uh, you, I started my uh, marathon uh, visit at 8 o'clock this morning, and I've had a great time uh, meeting and talking with folks across campus. Um, I've had uh, you know, three wonderful surprises during all of this. One is that I'm told that this is uh, typical weather uh, for Vancouver, and um, I've really been enjoying it. Uh, so uh, folks have, have told me I can, you know, feel free to just move here uh, and sign a lease today, uh, that this is what I can expect. Um, the uh, one area where the stories are holding together is that I've enjoyed talking to so many folks across campus and I literally am unable to construct a map of departments and groups because everyone seems to be working with everyone else and there are uh, just all these different interdisciplinary groupings where folks are coming together and the stories are holding true when I talk to, to, to the different groups. So I'm, I'm really impressed and, and looking forward to uh, uh, my second day uh, visiting here tomorrow. Um, and then finally, I think she's disappeared. Um, uh, just kudos to Holly, uh, the magic person who pulled my schedule together and has done such a great job taking care of me here. Um, it's just uh, been a wonderful visit. So what I wanted to do today was uh, actually have a talk in three parts. So hopefully one of those three parts will be appealing and interesting uh, for what you, what you came for. First is that I do have this new job uh, as a director of Georgia Tech's Institute for People and Technology. And I want to tell you a little bit about what that is, um, if nothing else, because that's what I get to spend most of my time doing. And it's a certain perspective on what we're doing at Georgia Tech in terms of interdisciplinary research and the leadership that universities uh, can play in terms of major industry questions and major societal questions. Um, and from that perspective, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, healthcare writ large. Uh, so in this case, I'll be describing a portfolio of researchers from across Georgia Tech and the folks that we're working with, um, because it, to me, it's important about how we're pulling all these pieces together. 
And then uh, hopefully I'll do those two parts pretty quickly and then I want to dive in with a little bit more of a personal narrative around the work that I've been doing and the work that I've been doing with my colleagues that really actually connects those pieces that you mentioned, connects the work in assistive technology, certainly the work in ubiquitous computing, and is what led to an agenda in personal health informatics. So if you make it with me to the end, uh, the, the great finality finale is trying to pull all those pieces together in terms of the framework that we think is emerging uh, in this space. Um, that said, at any point in time, uh, please wave for uh, questions. I'll be glad to take those interactively. I, don't, I know we're recording. I don't know if there's a, a, another audience, but um, uh, if nothing else, hello to those folks as well. So um, part, of my, part of my bio is that uh, before this current job, I was director of a, a laboratory called the GVU uh, lab at Georgia Tech. Hopefully many of you, some of you have heard of it. Um, and I think it's in some sense similar to ISIS here. I'm, I can't quite tell uh, yet. But it is uh, based in our College of Computing, but its mandate is to create a large interdisciplinary tent where people can come and do research on the, uh, the experience of computing. Based on those five years of, re of experience in that job, I was asked then to take uh, the job with this new uh, organization called the Institute for People and Technology, or IPAT is short. Um, and the, the mission for this particular institute is to uh, work across the Georgia Tech research enterprise and in particular industry facing leadership in sectors such as healthcare, media, education, and humanitarian systems. So I want to tell you a little bit about how this is structured, but for the most part imagine this is a networked organization that draws together academic faculty uh, across all the major colleges and, and relevant schools at Georgia Tech. It also connects our applied research faculty, so we have about 30 some odd full-time research scientists that typically have done uh, federal research, governmental research, um, but are, or, are oriented towards some of these industry sectors, as well as our economic development uh, activities. So its, its role is really what can Georgia Tech do within these spaces. <coughs> so the way that we've pulled this together is first it's very much a transdisciplinary research ecosystem. So we're pulling together researchers in human-centered design, and at Georgia Tech, that can mean uh, folks at interactive computing, but it also can mean folks in digital media, which sits within our humanities. It means folks that sit within the psychology, which is in our College of Sciences. It also means faculty that sit within our industrial design program, which is in our College of Architecture and other programs at large. So how do you pull those folks together? And then you, pull the, you couple that with faculty in system science and engineering, <coughs> uh, faculty in computing and information technology, as well as faculty in policy and management. And then the next stage of that is then to say, how can those groups have translational impact? What are ways that we can make sure that the output of what we're doing in research is having an impact in industry? And um, one of the mechanisms, one of our primary mechanisms <coughs> that we use for doing that is what we call our living laboratories. So maybe some of you have heard of the Aware Home. This is one of the laboratories that we have at Georgia Tech. But these are places where the results of the research are experienced day in and day out by practitioners or everyday users. So we have a living laboratory that is the future of home technologies. We have living laboratories that are the future of educational experiences, the future of media experiences, the future of mobile computing, and so on. Um, it's great from a translational research perspective because if people start to become used to using these new systems and they're more quickly adopted within industry, um, the secret sauce is that we actually do better research when we do it in the context of these living laboratories because our researchers are closer to the ground in terms of the real problems and people's, things that people are experiencing. Um, and then the final piece of that is that to have the transformational leadership that we want to have in industries, that we have to be able to connect with major companies. So um, these are folks that we partner with, folks that sponsor our research, um, and in many ways become active participants in the agendas that we co-create together. So in the end, we are focused on, again, uh, innovations within health, education, media, and humanitarian systems. Um, and we are pulling across uh, probably over 100 some odd faculty that are academic and applied uh, faculty at Georgia Tech um, with at least 30 or more uh, major industrial partners within that space. Um, we do a tremendous amount of uh, research within this, but the main point is that we're trying to have, um, we're trying to amplify, we're trying to increase the impact that we have in, in these particular systems. So as an example of that, I wanted to show this particular chart. Uh, this came out of um, multiple rounds of faculty uh, research uh, sessions 
Uh, what I've learned is that if you uh, invite faculty to a strategic planning uh, meeting, they will find other things to do. But if you call it a strategic task force or research something and you serve food, they will show up. Um, and especially if you say, tell us the research that you're supposed to be doing, and by the way, how should resources be allocated to that, then you really get participation. Um, so through this process of working with the faculty members, uh, what we wanted to do was identify what was our overall strategy? What was our overall agenda? How did we, how did we think that Georgia Tech could make a difference in transforming healthcare? Um, I suspect that you guys are familiar with the woes of the United States and our particular healthcare system. Um, and uh, so we've got a number of challenges to face that are specific to the US, but in many ways uh, uh, generalized to uh, the, the developed world. So what we came up with was the set of uh, research areas where we wanted to focus our attention and focus uh, our efforts, and in particular where we thought that Georgia Tech could have a major role, a major voice in this. Um, and these areas came out of a uh, perspective of saying, first off, is that we thought of healthcare as a complex adaptive system. Um, and so for those of you who are familiar with the work we do at Georgia Tech, we think of uh, HCI is, is including or also moving to this notion of human-centered computing where we're looking at socio-technical systems. So it's about the person's interaction with the, with the technology, but it's also about many people interacting in a, in a complex systems of many moving parts, and how can you also organize that system well? So much closer to, to questions in CSCW, as well as organizational psychology and beyond. And then from that system point of view, the questions were, well, what was necessary to both understand and uh, affect the system, um, and what were some of the avenues that we could take within that? So if we zoom in on some of this, part of this uh, we focused on aspects of modeling and simulation. So I don't know um, if I managed to draw any industrial engineers uh, to this talk, um, but this is uh, one of the areas where uh, system science and system engineering has a great deal to play. Uh, so we've done work in terms of how do you model a complex adaptive system, in terms of how do you model a full healthcare system, and then how do you optimize care within that. So some of the examples can be as simple as the logistics of moving massive amounts of vaccine, uh, whether uh, you're doing that in terms of a massive vaccination campaign uh, in the developing world, or if you're trying to figure out what to do with a flu epidemic uh, like the one we're having in the United States now. But it could also be personal optimization. So for example, we have uh, research on uh, parents come in with their kids, they haven't quite gotten the immunizations that the kids should have had over time, how do you actually create a personalized immunization schedule for children because you don't want to just sit them down and say, okay, well the kid needs you know, 10 shots in one particular visit. Uh, not nice to the kid and it's actually not uh, uh, an appropriate thing to do within a healthcare setting. Once you take this notion of how do you optimize or how do you look at complex adaptive systems, some of the other things that we've done is we've taken that and brought this into the world of uh, architecture in terms of uh, um, uh, the architectural design of spaces. So uh, for those of you, I know many folks have done work in kind of cave-like uh, uh, virtual environments and immersive environments. We're doing that with uh, our faculty in architecture, but in this case, what they're doing is modeling future healthcare spaces where that entire em environment is embedded with the data associated with healthcare processes. So for example, if you were gonna design a clinic where you were worried about hospital acquired infections, um, you would actually take the data in terms of what is understood about where hospital acquired infections occur, what types of surfaces, what types of practices, and then you would learn how to design kind of the next generation of the space to mitigate those concerns and to encourage best practices. So it actually creates an immersive environment where healthcare practitioners can work with architects together as opposed to what happens today, which is that typically people build beautiful spaces and then the doctors and nurses walk in and say, well, this isn't gonna work, you know, and hear all the reasons why, and then they attempt to retrofit those spaces. And then finally, our last area, which is um, a great deal of fun uh, for, uh, and, and uh, one of those audacious projects uh, that we, we try to accomplish, is we're trying to build what we call a fight, flight simulator for healthcare. So again, uh, I flew on an airplane yesterday not counting the, the Dreamliner, uh, most of us would expect that uh, the, the bugs and kinks of building uh, aircraft are worked out primarily in modeling and simulation. Uh, you know, we don't build bridges anymore where you drive across the bridge with heavier trucks until it, you know, the bridge breaks and then you rebuild it. But we kind of build healthcare systems that way, right? We take our, our best knowledge of, of uh, practices 
and we create local optimizations, and then we land up with a system that doesn't work well uh, as, as a whole system. So we've actually worked on technology where we're taking some of the same modeling techniques in engineering and system science and building agent-based simulations, uh, dynamic modeling si simulations, process flows, and so on, so that you can actually test out future versions of a healthcare system, um, you know, interactive, as, as opposed to just implementing it and see what happens. This is particular, particularly relevant in the United States where we're moving, trying to move from transaction-oriented systems to outcome-oriented systems. It sounds like a great idea, but the folks who are investing in it would really like to know if they're going to run out of money in the meantime um, and how they do this. So as I said, this is a question where we're, we're taking uh, the best that we know about interactive simulation technology and, and information visualization, and we're now bringing those concerns into a much wider swath of stakeholders and kind of an agenda behind that. There's a bunch of work uh, that, uh, that's uh, alongside that that is actually just looking up at kind of the wiring of healthcare systems, health information exchange. I don't know how many people here work on those types of standards uh, in terms of how healthcare information is transmitted between practitioners and then how uh, stakeholders such as physicians are starting to use new technologies. There's a lot of questions, hopefully some folks here in the mobile space are looking at what does it mean if, if a physician or radiologist is accessing information with mobile technologies on the go as opposed to the traditional information technologies uh, that they've been using. So we've looked at a number of areas within that. Uh, key to this is the fact that um, many, many aspects of novel sensor data is going to come within our healthcare systems. And right now, uh, the information processing and especially the information visualization technologies that are available to folks are completely overwhelmed by the potential of this information. Um, Bill Stead, who's a vice chancellor at Vanderbilt, one of the major medical centers in, in the US, has this beautiful graph. Uh, it's kind of a little bit like Bruce Tognazzini's old graph where it talks about the amount of information uh, that a typical physician works with, um, the typical cognitive capabilities of a physician, which are fairly flat or declining, um, and then the amount of information that's expected to be within that system with even just a five to 10 year time period. Um, and the physicians are already overwhelmed now by the information that's available, much less what's headed their way. <coughs> So the question for us is how do you actually build systems that not only provide information into the system but actually start to provide the attributes to help people manage that. One quick example can be if um, as a typical pervasive healthcare uh, scenario, you know, you're getting blood pressure readings from everywhere, from wearable technologies, from in the home, from clinics, from, from where have you. Uh, physicians are very interested in the providence of that information. Where did it actually come from? And the level of trust or their level of sense making around that information needs to be, uh, needs to be supported by understanding where the information came from in the first place. Another example, and I'm going to spend time going deep in this area, so I'll just talk on this, is that uh, many of, the, uh, many of the, the hope or potential of future healthcare technologies uh, focuses on empowering individuals. And I've become more and more convinced of this approach the longer I've worked in the, in the healthcare side of the space. Um, everything from uh, healthcare conditions that are focused on human behavior, whether that is heart disease, whether that is diabetes, um, uh, relies on somehow empowering or shifting individuals' behavior in a more healthy direction. Um, anything associated with uh, depression also relies on somehow being able to connect with individuals in terms of their behavior and their attitudes um, and what they're trying to accomplish in daily life. Um, but one of the statistics that I just learned, which astounds me, is that uh, the major cause for transplant failure, anyone want to guess? Adherence to the medications. Right? I thought it was something physiological. I thought it was something in you know, rejection or what was going on in the body. No, it's just the ability of patients to correctly take the medications associated with that particular, uh, particular set of transplants. That's astounding to me that we would have such a large failure rate in something that's so expensive and something as so as dramatic as transplants and those failure rates are associated with patient behavior, they're not associated with the surgical techniques themselves. So anything that we can do that is creating situations that will help lead people one way or the other to healthier behaviors associated with uh, healthcare scenarios is what we talk about in terms of this notion of empowered ubiquitous health. And I'm gonna come back in detail uh, this agenda more in a minute. But the, the fourth quadrant and the one that I wanted to pay uh, some attention to 
is this notion of how do we actually increase uh, evidence, uh, more evidence into the healthcare system. So this may surprise you. I've already complained that there's too much data within the system. We're going to have more data with sensors. But the reality is there's a lot of data that we need that is missing. And uh, much that I read about, who are all the healthcare professionals that I'm antagonizing so far? I know some of you guys are sitting over here. And they're not owning up to it. Um, the, uh, you read about evidence-based medicine. And you actually find out that um, much of medicine and healthcare as its practice is uh, sorely lacking in evidence. Um, and some of that evidence is, is decades old. And so the question of how do we actually build a robust system of evidence-based medicine, especially as evidence that surrounds an individual as opposed to evidence that surrounds uh, a normative notion of a population category is very important. So some of the work that we're uh, doing here um, again, coming out of the Aware Home ag agenda, I don't know if any of you know Gregory Abowd or, or, or Professor Jim Ray, uh, they have a new uh, research uh, program in behavior imaging. Um, and what that is, is the question of how do you take, uh, in some sense, videotape, so all of the computational perception folks here, how do you take uh, video of human behavior and use that as data that is critical for diagnosis and prognosis of medical treatments? Um, this work was motivated by Gregory's work in uh, children with autism um, because one of the things and actually one of the major uh, therapeutic techniques now is that the evidence of how a child interacts with a parent, how a child uh, would make eye contact with his or her mother, um, how they would play simple games such as passing a ball back and forth or patty cake. I don't know how those of you who had little kids. Um, how a child responds to environmental stimuli in the area. If you watch a videotape of a young child in those types of settings, all of the clues about whether this child may suffer from some form of autism are within that video. Right? And they are available to an expert way before a pediatrician or way before a parent would recognize this. Part of the problem is that many cases, many types of behavioral developmental delays like autism is that a child will, maintain, will reach a certain level of capability and then they will regress. And I know being a tired parent of two children myself, you kind of check all those milestones, right? My kid has accomplished this, right? They did the block stacking. Check, they've done that, right? And you don't notice that six months later they have regressed from that ability um, in kind of the flurry of everything associated with parenting and children. So the goal of this work is then how could you take uh, you know, the video information about someone behaving in a natural environment and start to unpack those clues in the case of kids with autism, you're really understanding gaze or you're really understanding uh, uh, reactions to environmental sounds. Um, but there's also cases in terms of early diagnosis of dementia, um, early diagnosis of, of uh, depression, and the diagnosis part tends to be kind of the sexiest part of the problem. But what's really important is how this information can be useful in prognosis. So if you have a kid who's been diagnosed as autistic or if you have someone who's been diagnosed as suffering de from depression, and they're on a certain type of medical intervention, right? The common, it could be uh, rehab, it could be different therapeutic techniques, it could be uh, 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 pharmaceutical. How do you actually know if that intervention is working? Uh, there's a tremendous lack of medical evidence within this area. So this has uh, been a great uh, opportunity for us to take the work that we've done in computational perception, which is akin to, I think, some of the work that's done here as well, and then um, figure out ways of making that available uh, actionable by medical professionals within their, within their field. Um, other things that I've done with this, uh, I want to mention one other area because we were just talking about it briefly beforehand and then I'll move on to the other part of the talk, is uh, this question of what does personalized medicine mean? Okay, so the healthcare folks have refused to, uh, to, to raise their hands, um, but for most folks when you hear personalized medicine, it ha has historically pointed to the potential of genetics. Right, that if we, can, you know, if we can unlock the genetic code, that we're going to have all of this information that helps hone in on a person's individual genetic signature and both you know, future and current uh, healthcare uh, challenges. And what we're discovering is that genetics is only a very small part of the picture, um, but much of disease and much of wellness is also related to your experience within your environment, as well as related to your own behavior and your own ability to, to adhere to certain types of healthcare regimens. What I would love to accomplish over time, and there's some of us that are starting to work within the space, is how do you build um, a, essentially a collection of data around an individual 
that could guide personalized treatment, whether it's per personalized treatment for diabetes, which is one of the areas that I've worked in, personalized treatment for Parkinson's, personalized treatment for depression. And it would have to be able to mine and work for that this notion of the individual being their own norm as opposed to sampling from large population norms, which is typically what's done within healthcare data. I think there's great potential. It's probably another career's worth of, uh, of focus in terms of a research agenda, but that's where we're going to actually be able to make some of the, the major uh, differences. One example of this, we have a, um, an iPhone application called iTrim at Georgia Tech, and it uh, is oriented towards people with Parkinson's. So if you take medication for Parkinson's, maybe your medication gets adjusted every three months or every six months. Um, but if you had something that was constantly sampling your trimmer, like how you hold a phone, you could use that information so that you could much more closely monitor and adjust prescribed medication dosages. Right? So you could, in some sense, be changing medication dosing on a daily basis um, as opposed to, again, every three months, every six months, every year. So it's the potential of being able to sample what's going on with an individual 24-7 within their environment and integrating that information in terms of their, uh, of, of any kind of healthcare intervention. So this is the, the potential that I would like uh, us collectively uh, to be working towards. So I want to come back and focus uh, the rest of the talk on this notion of empowered ubiquitous health. Um, and I'm going to take a little bit of license to talk about the work that I've done in a bit of a narrative because it really has been a discovery process for myself and the folks that I've worked with. Um, and then again, try to pull all this back together in terms of the agenda that we're working towards. Uh, so as Karen mentioned, I got my start of thinking about designing personalized healthcare experiences quite accidentally because I was working at Xerox Park and I was working with Mark Weiser and was looking at uh, what was going to be the experience, how would you design the experience of ubiquitous computing? Um, and in fact, this was the agenda that I took back with me to Georgia Tech was this question of uh, what were the implications of everyday computing? What were the implications if people were around computing devices all the time? Um, this, for those of you who are significantly younger than I am, will seem like an odd agenda because this is the reality that you live in. Um, however, back when we were starting this, you know, there were no cell phones. My laptop uh, at the time that I had the year before was a 18-pound spark book. Anybody remember those? Um, and uh, you know, at Xerox Park, we were getting to live the experience of what it meant to have these devices kind of continuously available to us, but no one really understood how life was going to change. Um, I think it's interesting to look back of all the things where things have improved and maybe some things have gotten worse um, through uh, folks having these uh, um, uh, computational capabilities around all this time. I know that when, uh, when Sandy hit New York, um, of course, it was devastating in many ways, but apparently one of the things that was wildly noticed was that anyone kind of 20 and younger just got this collective nervous twitch that went into some cases uh, uh, bordering on depression because people had never been kind of disconnected. Uh, and this was such a foreign experience to them. And um, so as I said, many worse things about, about Hurricane Sandy, but it was interesting to, fo to folks that had kind of grown up in that world that being disconnected was an unnatural experience. Um, but where this work uh, happened for me was that uh, as I left Xerox Park and went to Georgia Tech as a faculty member, this facility was starting to be planned. So this is the aware home at Georgia Tech. Hopefully some of you have seen one of our uh, pictures of this. We uh, designed this as a home laboratory. It was actually funded through uh, the Broadband Center. That's a whole other story. Um, but we uh, designed this as a laboratory to understand the design of, of domestic technologies. And in particular, as you can tell, um, what it meant for those technologies if they could be aware of uh, the occupants within a home and what kind of services it could provide. Um, it's a fantastic building, kind of designed to look like a home. Um, I fought Chris Atkinson, for those of you who know Chris, that it should look kind of normal. Chris really just wanted to create a bunkhouse where like 20 graduate students live there continuously because they would always be working. Um, and uh, we've, had, we've had it drive many different scenarios in, in kind of the work that we're doing. Um, but in particular, I landed up working with Wendy Rogers in our School of Psychology and her expertise is in cognitive aging. And we started to focus on uh, how could technologies in the home uh, support what we call, uh, what others call aging in place. How could technologies in the home support independence and quality of life? In fact, it was this agenda that drove the final uh, 
uh, choice for the name of this facility um, because originally we were calling it an aware house. It's a house. Until I said in the meeting, yes, we're designing a warehouse for the elderly. <laughs> At which point we changed the name. So uh, it's important to test these things. Um, but one of the problems that we, we focused early on, and um, apologies, I still care, and I recently gave a TEDx talk, so I have all of these slides with pretty pictures because you're not allowed to have bullets and all of these things. Uh, so I recently uh, gave this talk that way. But uh, one of the problems that we focused early on was not necessarily a medical problem per se, but what was the challenges of uh, caregivers? So we looked at it kind of from a CSCW lens. What was the challenge of caregivers who were worried about an elderly parent uh, living alone? Uh, stereotypically, uh, this would be an elderly woman. woman. Uh, women tend to live longer. Um, and usually there would be some sort of crisis involved, such as the death of another parent, the woman's spouse, or some sort of medical crisis. And what would happen, and what we learned about this, because we were doing field work in assisted, uh, assisted uh, living centers, was at some point in time, uh, the adult child would take the leadership role, or the, the decider role in all of this. And what we heard over and over again was people saying, well, I just, you know, I don't live there. I live three time zones away. I live many states away. Um, I need to know uh, if my mom or dad is OK. And if I can't know that, I'd rather them move to this, you know, move to this institutional care setting so that I can, you know, what they essentially said, you know, is I need peace of mind. I need to know that they're OK. Um, and this wasn't the only reason, but this was the dominant reason for many of the decisions surrounding moving someone from their own home into an institutional care setting, really kind of against their will or against what they wanted to do. And I don't know how many people here have dealt with uh, aging parents and have, have wrestled with these kinds of questions. But when we started to delve deeper into this, what we discovered was when we talked to the, uh, when we talked to, uh, so then we talked to, to families where um, an elderly parent was still living alone in their own home, and we found out kind of the coping mechanisms. And we had one interview where the guy said, um, I just need to know, if I could know that my dad had gone to the curb, picked up the mail, and gone back, then that would be enough for me to know that my dad was having an okay day. So we had kind of this question of, it wasn't the tell me an emergency has happened, because lots of people were kind of trying to design to that. The question we were asked is, tell me if today's normal. And this was the slippery slope for me and how I got started on this journey. Because that sounds like an easy question. Is today a normal day? But again, let's go back to this notion of computational perception and how we work across the data. You know, what would, it, what would it, any of your data profiles look like so that you could decide whether you were having a normal day or not? And that was what we were facing within this. So we developed a system um, which we called the Digital Family Portrait. Um, and I will forever be haunted by those butterflies, but that was the, the best of our graphic skills at the time. And um, it was very ubicomp in nature. So it was supposed to be the person's picture as you would normally have, uh, you know, maybe in your living room or in the kitchen, like a normal framed picture. Um, tablets did not exist by then. We took apart laptops and broke them and remodeled them, had great fun. Um, but the, the visualization surrounding the person's picture would be these butterflies. And the butterflies were just supposed to give an indication of overall activity for that day. And that was a, uh, that was a proxy for, for normalness. Now, I'd like to tell you, and I don't know how many people, I know the graphics people are all working on their deadline, but we had all sorts of what were essentially bad suggestions about how to do this. And the suggestions were along the lines of, well, if she's having a bad day, maybe you could fade her picture out to gray. It was kind of like a Dorian Gray kind of thing, like, ooh. Um, but there were lots of requests of, you know, if something's wrong, you should have, like, you know, you know a big, like, something's wrong symbol. Um, and if, if things are great, you should have, like, a happy smiley face. Things are great. And the challenge with that is the limits of what we can perceive with sensing within the home, especially privacy-preserving sensing in the home, which is we couldn't really make that normative decision as today a good day or a bad day. But we could get enough information, which was kind of the equivalent to, did my dad go pick up the mail? Right? We wanted to see kind of the pattern of, did the, person's, did the person kind of follow their routine? And you could, you could do that by drilling down on kind of on an individual butterfly picture, and then kind of the, the overall scope of what that looked like. So um, I love telling the story, and then I'll move on from this particular project. But we did a, we did a, a major pilot deployment of this, and we actually worked with a man who was a Georgia Tech grad and his mom. Um, and uh, they used the system for, for just over a year. 
And so we have lots of great anecdotes from their particular use of that system. But one of the days, uh, the guy walked in after work and saw the system, and like the butterfly was like huge. It was just like break the border huge. It was something was clearly up. Um, so he was very curious about what was, what was going on. And so he uh, called up his mom. And I always describe this because I'm a southerner. I said he was a very good southern son. He knew that the worst thing he could do was to call up his mom and say, hey, mom, you remember that monitoring technology I've got? Well, it says you're up to something, so what's up? Because right? that would have been the first way for her to go unplug that in her home. Right? What he did was say, hi, mom, how are you doing? And she said, well, I've been having the best day. You know how I've been wanting to paint that hallway? Well, I finally got around to doing it. So I moved everything off, and I got the primer down. Um, and it's been great. And tomorrow, I'll be able to finish the painting. So what she had essentially done was bounce back and forth between two of the motion sensors. And she had done that in a way that was clearly atypical, because she doesn't usually paint her hallways. Um, and the son was like, well, that's great. Glad you had a good day, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, talk to you later, right? So he found out what he needed to know. The system worked in the sense told him that something was up, and it didn't, wasn't in a, a perceptible invasion of her privacy. So when we interviewed his mom towards the end of the official part of the study, they kept using the system for much later. I was really worried about that interview, because she was in her 80s. And as far as I could tell in the study, the painting story being an example of this, she just kept getting healthier right? in my mind. I'm like, this woman was pretty independent. You know, she's painting her own house. She's doing this. She's doing this. She has to perceive of the system as an invasion. Like, why does she need this? And so we talked to her about it, and we showed her, you know, this is what the system looked like. Does that make sense? Yes, no. And we finally said, well, you know, how have you felt about having the system? And she said, well, I feel less lonely. And this was a surprise to us, because the system, the display was in his house. We had purposely not done a symmetric design like CSCW had told us. We hadn't tried to do a, what does his life look like? She literally didn't see anything. It was typical you become invisible, right? Just since it's in her home. So like, well, why does the system make you feel less lonely? And she said, well, there's days that go by where I don't talk to another human being, right? I'm you know, in my home doing my thing. And I just know with the system there that I have a connection to Rob, her son. And because we have this connection, I feel less lonely. Like this was a surprise to us that there was something about something where we had an intervention that was really oriented towards Rob, towards her son, but nevertheless had an effect on her impression of what it meant to, to live alone. So we continue on this on this story, and um, we continue to work on the, on the question of aging and technologies to support uh, aging in place. And it didn't take too long for us to run into the question uh, challenges of diabetes. Uh, diabetes, uh, I don't have the stats for Canada. I know it's a rampant disease for the US as well as other countries, um, India and Japan being one of those as well. Um, and it's a significant disease in terms of affecting people's lifestyle and eventually their independence. And so we were very curious about how technologies could be used to support and manage uh, uh, diabetes. And kind of like in our first study, where we started by interviewing folks at assistive living centers about what could be possible, in this case, we started uh, talking to folks who uh, were diabetes educators. So what's typical for them is they are patients, especially new, newly diagnosed diabetics, are recommended to come work with them. And they'll take a series of classes that are essentially learn how to be a diabetic, learn how diabetes works. Um, and this is an educational intervention that is alongside whatever uh, clinical intervention has been given to them. And so we started working with someone who looked a lot, a lot like this individual here. And what she told us and what was the clue that we worked with, so we, we kind of focused on that peace of mind clue in the previous project. On this, in this project, what she said is that diabetes is a high, such a heavily personalized disease. And this was uh, one of the uh, first times where I really run into just how personalized or how individualized the manifestation of disease is. And she says, what these folks really have to learn how to do is become detectives. They have to figure out how diabetes works in their own body, and they have to figure out what works for them, because there's no, there's no you know, the, the general prescription of how to manage diabetes is really so generalized, it's just you know, some, some rough guidelines. You know, they really have to figure out how to make it work for them. And she said, we need a system that will help them become detectives. And so we started with this, and what we designed, and this was old-fashioned mobile technology, but uh, we were giddy because we were using smartphones and Bluetooth uh, glucose uh, meters. 
and we just gave people the simplest piece of technology. It was really a probe-based design and said every time diabetes rears its head, every time you have to stop what you're doing and think about being diabetic, grab that instance and send that information to this diabetes educator. So it could be a voice message, it could be text. A lot, people took lots of pictures. They took pictures of things they ate. They, took, uh, they, talk, they left voice messages about when they were frustrated with their glucose readings. Um, and all that information would go from the smartphone up into a website that the diabetes educator could access. And then she could start having a dialogue with them about that particular data. So two things happened. One, for the diabetes educator, it was almost like a night and day experience because she would see these folks once a week and they would ask generic questions and she would give generic answers, but suddenly she was able to see inside their lives. And when they said they were eating a reasonable breakfast but that they were also taking a picture of it, she could see maybe it wasn't the case. Or she could see kind of little bits of frustration and could offer them very specific advice. What happened with the patients was that this engagement changed them from learning about diabetes from a book learning perspective to learning about diabetes for them. And instead of them trying to, to manage the whole thing, which was generally overwhelming, what they tended to do was pick one problem at a time. Um, so kind of uh, individual motivated learning, right? They were able to pick off that one problem. And a typical problem would be, I'm really frustrated. My blood sugar readings are high. All I've done is sleep. Why in the world are my numbers off the charts? And the diabetes educator, would, you know, part of it is the physiology of how your body starts to convert sugar when there's no food in your stomach. So she would say, well, did you have a late night snack? And she said, what? Well, late night snack? Um, she said, you know, somewhere back in the tutorial that they had it clued into that. And she, so she would suggest a late night snack. And then the next day they would pose, my sugar levels are still crazy high. And she would say, well, what was your late night snack? And she would say, a candy bar. It's like, maybe not a candy bar. How about some yogurt? But over time, people would get this one bit of mastery. They would start to control that individual morning reading. And then they would move on to the next thing. And then they would move on to the next thing. And what we would eventually see within our study design is that uh, the people who were in the experimental group started to peel off little bits of how diabetes worked for them. So by the time they got to the end of the study, they had taken the doctor's recommendation and personalized it. They had figured out what they could eat at their favorite restaurant. They could figure out what they could still eat at breakfast and what they had to give up. One person was holding on to orange juice for as long as they could, but you know, finally gave that up. What we saw in the control condition was that the folks who were still hanging with it were just following doctor's orders, right? just still the same generic diet. Now, what we know from this, from two things, one is that the folks who are still trying to generically follow doctor's orders were eventually going to fall off that wagon, right? It's impossible for, for people to continue that for any length of time. But what we saw in the data was that the individuals who uh, were using the system had a significant difference in what's called uh, the inter their internal locus of control. And this is a self-report measure, but it's, it's uh, validated within the healthcare community. And it uh, represents how much a person feels that they can have inner individual ownership or control about a particular healthcare situation. And so what we had was a bunch of folks that anecdotally had gone from feeling somewhat out of control within their healthcare space to feeling more in control, like they could actually do something. And the people in the experimental or the control condition who had been taught so much about diabetes actually had trended the opposite direction. They were feeling kind of less in control than they had when they started. So this is where this was another kind of clue within this is what could we do where you actually design an intervention that both clinically makes a difference, but we start to understand the keys of where you know, what's going on in, internally with a person in terms of the experience design. Um, where we are with this in this research going forward is that we now have an R01 grant. The student's graduated. She's at Columbia, but we're now working on the next version of this, which is to say, okay, let's say we don't have constant access to that educator. I actually think that's personally a reasonable assumption, but let's say we're, we're trying to figure out how to complement that. What can we do to create a learning environment? Um, so this allows folks to be able to take the individual challenges that they're working with uh, on a website, set up goals, again, individual manageable goals for themselves, and then we're also designing a mobile experience to support that. So I'll start to cruise through some of these a little bit faster, but you get a sense for the kinds of things that we're trying to experiment with. So we've worked with older adults, and that was challenging, but boy, we found something more challenging, which is working with adolescents. Um, so I don't know how many of you have uh, teenagers or preteens at home, 
Um, but when you're trying to work around health and wellness with adolescents, the first thing you have to recognize is that they believe they are immortal. Right? It doesn't really help to tell them that what they're doing now is going to have health consequences for them when they are older. Um, and they, you know, they really are just not going to care. What they do care about is interaction with each other on social media and self-presentation. Right? And so this project, which has focused us on how do we have a wellness intervention to increase physical activity. So how do we have people essentially increase their daily, daily experience of physical activity, not just doing something highly focused and transitory, but there's the daily experience of physical activity. How do we actually design social media experiences to, to support this? And so we have a game mechanic of, you know, it's a pretty simple game mechanic. They walk, they walk steps, the pedometer counts steps, the steps create fuel or points, and then we did design different kinds of social media games to, to leverage that. Now, we can do this in two ways. We've done this in, in cooperation with an American company called Humana, and I know I'm being recorded, but it's okay for me to say this. You know, they designed something that was competition-based. So you roll those out to schools, so you give kids pedometers, you put them in a competition, and voila, you know, they walk more because they're competing. All right. Well, two things happened. One was uh, they, the schools promptly uh, gave the pedometers to the kids who were already athletes um, because their school was going to win because those kids were already out running track and field. Right? So the intervention didn't go to the kids who needed it. Um, and then second is that we saw in the data that most of those change in activities were completely uh, 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 transitory, right? As soon as the competition ended, everyone went back. So how do you actually design something that ekes into people's experiences of the kids where it was working were things like, I've decided to walk the dog with my parents because I could get steps that way. Um, or, you know, I'm walking to school more. I'm, I'm figuring out ways of kicking it into the rest of my life. Those are the kids that we're after and those are the things that will work. So what we've done is, is, and this is a continued probe and a thing that we're working on, but how do you design that social media experience where it cannot be about head-to-head -head competition, but it starts to be a reinforcing experience? Um, and we have done this through the lens of gaming. So we've done a bunch of workshops with these kids who are essentially, it's a participatory design approach about how to design games. Um, and we've seen some really exciting things. Um, first, I don't know how many game designers we have here. You guys are not responding to any, uh, I'm like, at some point you have to tell me who's actually in the audience because none of this is working. Um, so uh, on the game design things, one is that um, kids interact with each other primarily asynchronously. Even text messages somewhat asynchronous, although it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Nevertheless, when you ask them to design games, they all want in head-to-head -head compete games. You know, I'm racing with my friend online. It's like, that's great, but your parents let you get online at 7, and, um, and their parents let them get online you know, you know, before homework or after homework. You guys aren't online at the same time. So it took a while to work with them in terms of how do you design a game where these points could fuel something that was a really meaningful asynchronous experience. And we've got, we got some good game designs. Um, we also had uh, uh, crazy gender differences. Um, and I guess not, now I understand why racing games are so big within the game industry, because that is the place where the genders come together. Right, you can do racing games. Um, the girls typically wanted to do collaborative, let's build something, dress up kind of games. Um, I mean, I'm all for equality, but you know, the data says you know, they wanted something very different. And the guys tended to want something that was sports-based in competition. So um, two really fun game designs that came out of this. One was, it was three girls and a guy. And so um, the girls won because it was a dress up game. Except then you could also dress up your character with like camouflage and guns, and the character could shoot at things. It's like, oh, this is bad. Um, so sometimes cooperative design is not a good thing. The most clever one, I love this game design, was um, they were trying to figure out a way to make the points meaningful, those fuel points. And so they came up with a game of underwater basketball, and the flow of the water was determined by which team had more points. So they actually kind of changed the playing field based on uh, my team had walked more points and the other team had walked more points. So that, those teams are starting to get this. So this work is in progress. But as I said, when, when it comes down to kids using this, if it's just like a fun and funky game, it's not going to have long-term effects. But if it can become part of their social media experience, because when they're logging in their points and everyone says, yay, this is great, and we're going to add this, and you know, you know, you're, you know, you've, you know, you've made your, your contribution or you've met your goal, those kinds of things, coupled with kids looking for everyday health experiences, might start to work. It's a really hard problem to solve, but uh, we're starting to at least make progress on all the things that we know don't work and some of the things that might work. Um, 
Another problem that uh, is hard to solve, but we've made some interesting progress on this, is influencing people's decision making around meals. Um, and this is, again, kind of an example of, you know, again, if people ate more healthy, they would have healthier behavior. Great. Um, telling people what to eat never works. Except what we designed was a system, and it's now a startup company called Usable Health, that provides personalized or at least semi-personalized menus, kiosk, when you walk into a restaurant. And so you can walk, and we've done this on campus, so you can walk in and basically, I'm trying to lose weight, I'm trying to manage this, I'm trying to bulk up because I'm an athlete, you know, you can kind of choose your health goals and it provides an ordered list of the things that you can order. So two things that we discovered, three things that we discovered with this. Uh, first is what it will do is it will nudge people to make decisions that are about 5% healthier, okay? You cannot tell people who want a cheeseburger that they need to order a chef salad. Will not work. However, if you tell people that, you know, someone really wants to order that cheeseburger, but you also give them a prompt of, okay, well maybe, you know, by the way, if you take the bacon off, um, I live in the South, sorry, um, <laughs> then this is the difference of what that means. And if you show people those differences in meaningful ways, they'll go, eh, okay, I'll be that much healthier. So we can get those little 5%, 5 to 10% nudges. Those can add up over time and actually make a significant difference. Um, the other thing that we've discovered was even people who thought they knew best, who really walked in, I'm going to order the most healthy thing possible, would still be surprised in terms of where the salt and the fat and the sugar are hiding in restaurant items. So being able to see, you know, I really thought this was the healthiest thing, but you're telling me this is better? Oh, I like that just as much. So being able to give people that level of visualization was a good thing. And then what was really funny from a business perspective, so we started working with some restaurants who were just willing to tolerate us doing this. They've now invested in this because A, ordering healthy tends to actually uh, make the price higher. And so again, that 5% difference is 5% more money for them. They like that. Um, but the other thing is that on this defied all of my HCI knowledge, um, people were faster on the kiosk than they were at the, uh, with the person, in-person ordering. Um, I didn't expect this. I thought surely the machine interaction was gonna slow it down. Um, but they were faster in terms of when they, when they deployed our system, they actually had to shut it down because the kitchen couldn't keep up. Um, and so all of these areas, when you especially add this notion of training um, and you add, uh, you know, how can you train every single person taking orders, you know, how can this be uh, uh, gluten-free or what about nut allergies or what about this allergies, it's much easier to encode that information. So this is one area that I think is going to prosper commercially. Uh, at least in the quick service type of, of restaurant situations. Um, and it's one of those areas where we can, st again, start to make a little bit of difference of people with just a little bit of motivation, we can move them in a healthier space. A um, Couple other examples. This is an example um, that has been a clinically successful example and now we have to figure out why. So this is Rosa Arriaga's work um, in uh, text-based interfaces for uh, um, asthma management. Um, again, I mentioned I live in the <coughs> South. Uh, we also, Atlanta is kind of the regional capital for children with asthma. And it's, we've actually taken this on in the state of Georgia of, uh, you know, no more unneeded deaths, right? We have kids dying from asthma attacks that they don't need to. Some things are very interesting about asthma as a clinical condition. Uh, one is that there is, it's really difficult to, fatality is not correlated uh, directly with severity of the disease which means kids that can have light to moderate asthma can land up dying versus kids with severe asthma can, can manage to, to, to deal with that. And it just has to do with the variations in how the disease is triggered and how kids manage it. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not an easy way for you just to triage your patients and say this person has a more severe case, we're gonna have a more direct intervention here. It's really all of the kids within this practice that are, are, have a potentially life-threatening disease. The second is that when a kid is undergoing uh, an attack and they're getting worse, they get quieter. So again, all the parents in the room, you know, you're used to when your kid is, you know, you know the nagging, I feel bad. When they're starting to really crash, they cr essentially crawl off in a corner because they feel really lousy. So parent, multiple kids, lots of stuff going on. You may actually not be aware of when your kid is crashing due to asthma because they are less likely to be in your face about it in any particular way. Um, and the second, the last thing about kids and asthma, remember kids are immortal. So even kids who are, are prescribed to be asthmatic have trouble um, 
integrating that into their perception of who they are and understanding what happens to them. And so if you ask them, are you having trouble sleeping? They'll say, yes, but it's because I you know, watched this scary movie and it's been scaring me and I'm not being able to sleep. Or it's because this happened or because that happened. They won't attribute it to being asthmatic. And so they don't start integrating in this notion of what's going on in their daily life and figuring out how the ramifications of, of their disease. So the text messaging app, and again this works, but now we have to figure out why, is very simple. We send a text message a day, and we essentially, um, and we ask things that are on a typical clinical questionnaire that you would fill out every three to six months when you go into the doctor's office. Um, we ask them like one question about their symptoms, it's always a yes, no question, and whatever they say to us, we provide some useful bit of information back. Um, or we ask them a true false question about something about asthma, and they provide that information back. Okay, crazy thing about this. First off, boring application. Kids kept using it. We lowered the bar just enough that they continued using this daily. Crazy result. Kids who used this application had clinically improved uh, pulmonary results within a three month time period. All right. you know, kids who were clinically better with their asthma with just a simple text message. Why is this working? We're not sure. We know it has something to do with the kids just overall, we know. We suspect it has something to do with the kids overall awareness of asthma that they're starting to integrate this in a way that they didn't before. It's not really changing their education levels. They're kind of learning a little bit, but learning is not the major effect. And it's really not affecting the physicians because heaven help us trying to affect physician practices but the one thing that we came up with is that if we provided one sheet of information that literally could intercept the physician in, you know, on the way into the uh, uh, exam room, that the, the physician would start working through that information. So we're able to impact that part of the practice. But that's not where we're getting these results from. So we know we can get better if we start working on these other pieces. But again, this kind of question of just a little bit of UB comp intrusion uh, around uh, with the, the most simple technology possible is starting to make a uh, impact. And the lower the socioeconomic group within this, the better the result on healthcare outcomes. So finishing up, uh, two projects that are ongoing, and then I want to finish this up with a little bit of theory. Sorry, I'm running close. Um, we have a new project where we've been working on personal healthcare record designs, um, and we're using, uh, doing this work with breast cancer uh, uh, current patients. Um, trying to understand what happens, this has now become another probe study, what happens if a person, when they are essentially, you know, yes, you've been diagnosed with breast cancer, yes, this is the treatment you're going to go through, and by the way, here's the personal tablet that you're going to take home, which is now going to be the interface for us working with you, um, and essentially the interface design is about designing the communication between the patient and the set of providers working with them. So like the digital family portrait, like the other things that we're doing is interface design is actually uh, the proxy for trying to figure out how to improve this engagement and improves, uh, uh, in this case, how these, uh, these women are able to work with the, uh, the healthcare system. The great informants, it's always great with all these designs to have a really good informant. The great informant in this project are what are called cancer navigators. These are people who are trained either from a clinical perspective or a social service perspective to guide patients, to help them navigate their healthcare journey. They are the best people to help us understand how an intervention at home may allow them to do that. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if the robotics folks are here. Um, uh, one of the folks that's been very interesting for us, thank you, is, is the work in social robotics. Um, and uh, quite curious in terms of how people's engagement with both an assistive robot, so this is pre-PR2, this is the LA uh, uh, robot that we've worked with, um, how that can aid people as an assistive technology within the home. Um, some things that have been interesting about this, so first off, robotic as a prosthetic aid, I think that's easy to see the potential with that. Two of the things that we have not anticipated, first off, is that people's surveys about privacy is uh, the preference for a robot in the home as opposed to a human uh, health worker. Um, all the work, in fact, I, I had a negative editorial written about me in AARP uh, back when I was doing the digital family portrait work because how dare I suggest that technology have a role in caring for older individuals. It's the only negative editorial that's ever been written about me. It was really kind of funny, scary. Um, but in this case, uh, the, what we're hearing from the surveys is that a robot, can be, a robot is more trusted, right? I will trust a robot more than I will trust that person who's gonna gossip to the neighbors 
or that person who may be rifling through my stuff when I'm not looking. So a preference for robotic assistance in the home is a really interesting thing to see. The other thing, and this is Andrea Tomaz's work with, with Simon, is that um, I always thought kind of the anthropomorphic robot was really about science fiction, right? Kind of this is what we expect from the movies. But there seems to be something about engaging a robot that has enough of a resemblance to another human being in terms of face, in terms of shape, in terms of expression, that, uh, that um, people respond to it in a way that is emotionally different than responding to even that same visualization on the screen. Again, we don't understand why, but it could have a great deal of potential. All right, so I've luckily run out of time right when I'm going to get to the theory side of this. Um, but one of the things that I want to point to is the challenge that we've had in pulling together a theoretical backdrop to inform our work. I think some of you may know my dean, Svi Galil. He's a theoretician. When he talks theory and I talk theory, it's not the same thing. But what I'm talking about is how do you have, how do you draw from a set of work uh, typically coming in the health behavior field that allows us to predict and understand why interventions work? I grew up in classic HCI. I grew up at it from an engineering psychology background. You know, we kind of understood this is what we understand about perception. This is what we understand about cognition. How do you design effective interfaces? What I have found in the work that we're having to do now is that we need a new theoretical backdrop which exists and we need to know how to connect this backdrop to the designs of computer mediated interventions. There's a sense of understanding how this backdrop works in terms of uh, human interventions, but what does it mean to design an intervention that improves self-efficacy? What does it mean to design an intervention which allows for um, uh, uh, locus of control, which is attribution theory? Um, we have a long way to go to figure out how to connect the theory to the design part, and we actually have a panel at CHI that's going to go through this. So, some of the things we've been able to peel off, we know about locus of control, we know about self-efficacy, uh, we're starting to learn about observational learning, so how the, the kids are learning things from each other, um, and how collective efficacy, those kids working together in a game, is actually much more powerful than individual self-efficacy. We don't have a sufficient theoretical backdrop for even basic things, like how do we understand the impact of privacy in terms of the adoption of these technologies? How do we understand this notion of the kids are more aware of being asthmatic? We need to be able to quantify this. We need to be able to understand this in more theoretical depth because these seem to be the theoretical building blocks that are leading to the changes that we want based on healthcare interventions that lead people to be willing to adopt interventions, that lead people being able to learn new behaviors, that lead people to be willing to experiment, to become detectives, uh, that lead people to be willing to play with identity presentation and their, their sense of being of health and wellness. Um, and then the really, really hard ones that actually lead people towards sustained behavior change. Um, you know, that is kind of the, the, the high bar with all of this work. And then even past that, I'm really interested in leading people towards new notions of mastery. So it's one thing to kind of learn up about a disease and something that you know, but then the other question is how do people achieve certain levels of mastery in terms of their own health and wellness, and how do they know they've had, they have that mastery, because that's where the self-efficacy is going to really kick in. So all of these things are essentially for those of us working in the intersection of the human-centered computing HCI world and the health world are requiring us to have um, uh, a greater uh, toolbox of theoretical tools and then I think a huge unexplored agenda which is what does it mean to take these theoretical tools and make interventions. So you know, everything that I've described so far is embarrassingly new. Uh, it's pilots, it's you know, our first question about how to do this. Um, many of these things like the diabetes work, like the asthma work are going, you know, those, those projects continue and I've given you a sample of those, but we've got a long way to go to figure out kind of everything that's possible in terms of ubiquitous health. And then, you know, again, back to my day job, how do we plug that into our other uh, technologies and other ways of trying to approach healthcare transformation? So only a little late, I hope. Um, but thanks everyone for your attention, um, for not raising your hand at all when I asked you questions. Um, but um, maybe this is a time when you can ask me some questions as well. Okay, can you ask me? I just wanted to know about um, computer science. Computer science. <laughs> Labs for him. Okay, uh, name, rank, and serial, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to know about uh, the caring for 
elderly. Uh, that project, what year was this? And you just mentioned about uh, running this experiment in one home. Were there any other people, uh, other users, participants in that study, and what was their experience? Okay, so which project? I'm sorry. Uh, the mother incident. I, I'm not feeling. I don't. I feel less lonely. That I feel. So this is the digital family portrait work. Unfortunately, you know, the student graduated. Um, I hate that when that happens. Uh, and then uh, they continued on. Uh, and we actually waited for industry to pick this up. So there, there, some of you are familiar with some of the work by Intel has looked at this space. Um, we spent a long time trying to get a commercial uh, program around this. Uh, so unfortunately, it didn't carry on its research because it had a lot of exposure when it started. And no student wanted to come in and be like the second study on this. Um, and so we were really hopeful commercially, but we ran into a classic Ubicom problem, which is how do you have pervasive sensing in the environment uh, to fuel these types of displays? And it's only recently that some of the work in infrastructure-mediated sensing um, and even some of the work that was at the Consumer Electronics Show uh, last week has started to provide us hope in terms of how to do this. So now you see a number of industries that are starting to experiment with this approach. Um, I was young and naive at the time, and I actually thought this would go much faster uh, into commercialization. Um, but it's taken a while for all the other pieces to fall into place. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is a very US specific thing, um, but um, a version of this that is, is taking hold is looking at 30-day readmits. Um, and what this means is that hospitals, hospitals are penalized now in the US if they discharge someone and they show back up in the hospital in some sort of, for some related condition um, within 30 days. And so one version of monitoring with this technology is going to be looking at how people are faring uh, with hospital discharges. Um, and so that's going to be another, another take on this. Any other questions? Uh, yes, and then behind you. I'm doing HRI stuff. Um, and I was curious, you're talking about home aid, home health care robotics, mm -hmm. and you uh, touched very briefly at the end on the issue of embodiment and how people yep. respond better to an embodied robot than like a, an agent on display. Um, is that work you've done? Can you talk a little more about that? So this is, um, uh, I always get her name wrong, Maya Majark. OK. Um, Southern California. Yeah. So this is some of the work that she's been doing. I've also seen it written up in another context. So this isn't work coming out of us. I know that it has some to do, the, the notion of how people respond to an anthropomorphic shape informs Andy Ritamaz's work, but not in a healthcare setting. So again, we've just seen some initial clues about this. So I'm not promising that this, this is holding. Um, I, do, I do think it matters tremendously in terms of uh, the application or the intent. So I think the interest has been in, um, there's a lot of robotics that seem to be oriented towards uh, helping people with healthy eating. And my character, this is the robot standing between the, me and the refrigerator. Um, but something about the anthropomorphic interaction actually seems to be persuasive within this. Um, but that's un unclear. And then also something that's really, people who are looking at this related to depression. Um, this is not to say that all robots need to be anthropomorphic. Uh, the most popular robot we have, and I don't, Charlie will tell, you'll tell him that I got this wrong, but it's kind of the scooper one. And this is a very simple robot, which its uh, entire function is to be able to kind of scooch up to something, sweep it into a pan, and lift it up to you. And so for someone who's in a wheelchair, or someone who has mobility impairments, it literally is just dealing with the problem of things I've, that have fallen on the floor that I can't reach to pick up. Um, again, I'm naively optimistic about commercializing this robot. But when the folks that we've worked with, this is, this is hugely popular uh, with, you know, they want one of these. Um, everyone can guess what is the, the most requested object to be picked up off the floor? Glasses. Not the glasses. The remote. The remote control. <laughs> but you know, nothing like feeling like anytime something's on the floor that you have to ask a caregiver or wait just for the simple act of picking something off the floor. Um, when I was nine months pregnant, I really would have loved this. If something fell on the floor, I was just like, mm, it's going to stay there. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Computer Science, HCI, working with Karen. Okay. Um, 
So I'm curious about the uh, work with the adolescents and the exercise game. Yep. Um, what did you use for sensing? Was it just a pedometer? Yep. Uh, okay. And um, have you built either the game designs yet or deployed them or seen how it works? So we're in the midst of doing the final deployment. So stay tuned on those results. What we've done is three summers of participatory design exercises. So we're starting to get a much better sense on the kind of the games that kids would want to use and how. Okay. Um, before we did this work, we did a project that was um, associated with the American Horsepower Challenge, if you've read any of that work. Um, and that was the one that was the big national deployment. And Humana brought us in as third party researchers to try to understand how that design worked or didn't work. Um, and that was a really interesting investigation of that. Um, the pedometers were just, you know, luckily technology is catching up to make them cheap enough and reliable enough that we can avoid some of the sensing infrastructure problems that we had uh, in the past. It's also important with the kids that you set personalized norms but on a baseline. So it's not that steps equate points, but your steps compared to your baseline or goal generates points. Also, um, so to follow up, um, and I've already, what, what was the age group for the hmm? kids? The, what, the age group for the adolescents? The kids, um, um, kind of the 10 to 12 area. Um, and because of that, we have to design our own social media platform. Um, we wanted to use Facebook, but you can't officially be on Facebook unless you're 13, despite the, all the people who are on there who are not 13. Uh, but more importantly, working with the school system, they would not let us design an intervention on Facebook. But we have all of the challenges of getting them to go to a social media site that's not Facebook. Yes, sir. I'm computer science. Um, I have a question about privacy. There are issues, like, there are places like um, the Cancer Commons and patients like me where people seem to be, give up privacy yep. very quickly yep. for, um, if they think it's in their game. Have you found that as well, that people are... So I've found that the people who care most about privacy are privacy advocates. Um, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, but what we have seen when working with patients is that people come to much more nuanced uh, trade-offs in terms of what they work with. Uh, when we did the work with the digital family portrait, uh, first off, we didn't design, I, one of the other bad suggestions was essentially the equivalent of granny cam, right? Like a video cam, you know, looking at an older individual. Nobody, no one wanted that. Um, but what we found working with individuals was that they were going to have to deploy these technologies in a usable way for their social context, which meant when we were talking to older, an older uh, woman, she would basically say, well, this daughter, uh, and maybe this son, but not her, or not him, because I don't like his wife, or not this, you know, literally, you know, these people were okay and these people weren't. So it was a highly personalized decision about who could receive information about them. Um, one of the things that we've seen lots of studies that we've done with older adults where they have made decisions that uh, were contradictory to our stereotypes. So uh, in many cases, uh, sharing of information within a controlled social cohort, trusted cohort of some form, was completely acceptable. Um, but when we designed interfaces, uh, we had this cool thing called the gesture pendant. Thad Starner did this, and it was like a fancy remote control. People didn't like it because it made them feel feeble. So this notion of technologies reinforcing the identity of not being able to do something was offensive to them, and they didn't want that. Um, so that's not privacy related, but it's kind of a surprise within that. Patients like me and other arenas like this is, is hugely interesting. Um, I think it is very interesting in terms of how it is challenging medical authority um, and challenging where data is coming from and where this is going to go is hard to say. Um, they're getting all their funding from the ph pharmaceutical industry, so I'm also kind of jaded about them. Um, but I think it's, it, it, is, it is the case where when people can see a benefit and it's a socially acceptable benefit, they're willing to give up their information. Okay. Um, HCI, Thank you. Science. Um, Yep. So, uh, this question is about um, breadth of populations that you're working with, and I know you're working with uh, yep. grad students as well. But so it's a very impressive array, both on the age dimension mm -hmm. as well as on the the impairment mm -hmm. uh, or disease dimension. Um, so. Do you have some silver bullet or recruiters at Georgia Tech that help? I just know in my own yep. personal experience working with people with aphasia, you know, like it was just a huge amount of effort just to get the participants in. Yep. Now that's a very specialized um, population. But even with older users, it's it's not trivial. Yep. So how do you how do you do it in terms of the breast? So silver bullet. So this goes back to that other hat, that institutional hat that I'm wearing, which is one of the things that GVU and IPAP has provided has been uh, uh, working that engagement with patient populations. So Georgia Tech, for example, announced this big partnership with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. It's the largest pediatric uh, healthcare provider in the US. 
Um, so we now have, you know, and, and that still doesn't translate to any individual clinician, but it, it provides a door to working with a huge population uh, set within that. Uh, within, uh, um, you know, within the, with children, uh, we have a number of folks that work extensively in school systems, and so they kind of provided us kind of the way to get into that space. Um, other things like when we started with the digital family portrait, we literally cold called assistive living centers, and um, our first major volunteer heard me give a talk and came up and volunteered to participate. So it's it's taken time over the years to, to build up that, but. It's a, huge, it's a huge help, like Wendy Rogers maintains this huge set of seniors that she works with day in and day out. And so when we're able to create that as a resource for our research community, as opposed to every single researcher having to go and, and it's just, it's too much work uh, to do that on a kind of faculty member by faculty member basis. Um, and then I, is for those of you who are paying attention, you guys know I talked about kind of over a decade of work. Um, so, you know, these things kind of come and go uh, and take time. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm a software developer in uh, EMR field, electronic medical records. Okay. The question I have around the family portrait that uh, you had, did you do anything around like prescriptions and medications? Is the old person taking his medications or do yeah. they need refills, that kind of stuff? So again, this is the oldest project. So most of those uh, systems around EHRs did not exist uh, back then. And we certainly didn't have the engagement with pharmacies to be able to do that. So they had internal systems that we didn't have access to. We literally focused on a proxy for human activity. In this case, it was room to room motion. Um, and we had used uh, a variety of wireless sensors to, to accomplish that. Um, we actually did another project that was based on um, medication adherence. Um, but in this case, it was, we were focusing more on what would be an effective intervention to improve medication management, and it was less about kind of awareness of that to the outside world. So this is a project called Memory Mirror. Um, and we've, we've, in this case, we focused on the fact that most of the work is on adherence, and as I, with my transplant story, that's very important. Most of the emergency room uh, admissions after falls, the second one is medication management, and it's the conflict between over-the-counter drugs and uh, prescription drugs that's causing this. And so we focused on an interface that would be flexible enough for people to be able to understand and manage their medication with, with being able to, to mix in these, uh, these different kinds of drugs. Um, so still lots of work to be done on this space. Um, with the, the portal that we're doing with um, the, the breast cancer patients, uh, medication management is going to be part of that. <coughs> and next year, yes? Uh, yeah, I'm, I also work with uh, the MR industry. And I was wondering about your project on the mobile app for, or I don't know if it was a mobile app, but it was a texting app for the asthma patients. Yes. Um, and you showed some like data charts, and you were talking about a vision of like having that be available to physicians. Yep. So I'm wondering like how. Could you explain a little bit more about how So we, what we did was we did a couple things. Um, we created a dashboard that the uh, physician office could use where they could see all their patients. And you could essentially, if we were gathering information that would be meaningful, we could flag individuals, essentially kind of green, yellow, red in terms of where they were. But because it wasn't integrated into the mainstream system, they rarely went to the dashboard. So we designed it, but folks didn't use it. Um, but what, we, what was effective was that one page printout that could literally walk with them into the exam room. Um, so we were able to use that. One of the things, and I'm going to try to get the name of the term right, but all of our questions that we were sending via text message was based on a standard survey and scoring system that physicians use. But typically patients fill that out in the waiting room and they're trying to remember how life has been for the past three or six months. Um, so we were essentially able to create a rolling score based on the daily sampling. Um, and one of, the, one of the areas where the practitioners are interested is the greater veracity of that rolling score as opposed to what they're getting when, when folks are filling out the survey in the rating room. But that is still yet to be proven. So we're, we're continuing to work with that group, and that's one of the things that they're interested in. Um, the vision that I've heard, but I have yet to see anyone practicing this, um, but this goes back to Billstead and others, is Imagine flipping a practice, a medical practice completely. So instead of the patients you see are the ones who have essentially shown up at your door, but instead the patients that you see are based on you monitoring their healthcare status and you've seen the ones that are starting to, to, to get into danger and you've proactively asked them to come in. 
we're a long way from any vision of that, but these, these are the kinds of systems where you could actually tell when a patient is, is, um, is Eric Corbett describes this as you know, trying to keep someone in flight and when you, you start to see that they're crashing. Um, but we're, that's a whole transformation of the healthcare practice to be able to use that data. Mm -hmm. right, um, so, just a quick question on the broad range of work that you, you presented. Yep. There's a section on the ubiquitous computing side. Sorry, I'm computer science and robotics. Okay, I'm excellent. Anyway. You're in the robotics row. Okay. <laughs> perception. Um, so, the ubiquitous computing where you have the mobile technologies helping people with healthcare, uh, managing their conditions and living life normally. And on the other end, at the very end, you showed the ring the robotics, mm -hmm. home care robots helping people. Do you see a bridge between these two things? Basically, what I'm saying is, can the mobile technology that people are actually using can somehow incorporate robotics into that mode? Yeah, and this is, uh, and Elizabeth's. Not uh, done yet. Yeah. Elizabeth's not here, she and I talked about this briefly because I finally, in, in, in my conversation with her, I finally said, okay, let me tell you my pet peeve with roboticist um, and let me know what you think about this, which is that I, I you know, and I, there's a, quite a few roboticists at Georgia Tech. Um, the, uh, I feel like the robotics community as a whole values research, which is the equivalent of you take a robot, you dump it in a completely unfamiliar territory, um, and it's able to navigate and do something successful, right? So if they're going to Mars, um, and then like Robin Jeffrey's work, which is humanitarian disaster relief. Home healthcare robotics should be taking advantage of the fact that there's sensing in the home, that there's an electronic healthcare record, uh, that's information coming from mobile devices. What I would love to see is someone designing like a super powerful smart robot that takes advantage of all these other information sources. Um, and really uh, integrates that information and treats the robot as part of that system. Um, and there, I think there's been, there's been bits of that in terms of the human-robot interaction, how to make that part successful, but I would love to see something that's more of a system design. Uh, when we started the Aware Home Project, Chris Atkinson always used to say that think of the home as a robot turned inside out. Um, because of the sensing and actuation throughout the home. So what I'd love to do is think of the home as a robot turned inside out with then robots inside the home and how they work together. Um, so I, I think there's huge potential and I'd love to see, I think with electronic, so I'm catching my EHR folks, I think with electronic healthcare records and some of the things we have now, we could do a lot more in that space than we could have when I started this 15 years ago. Okay. Question. I, maybe a hard one, maybe an easy one. Uh, what, you know, you've shown this huge array of mm -hmm. work that's covered a decade at least of work on the and uh, it's explored a lot of different problems. What's, what's surprised you the most and what's made you the most excited and optimistic about the future? In other words, this is going to work as opposed to, this seemed like a good idea but I maybe didn't pan out the way we thought. What was, what was the most optimistic, exciting, and surprising thing? Maybe not the same. Maybe not the same thing. So I think the thing that I'm most optimistic about, but again, maybe it's because we haven't tried to do it yet, um, is uh, we're starting to get these hints of, uh, again, uh, <coughs> diagnosis data, clinical data, um, uh, personality profiles, behavioral data, environmental data, and starting to figure out how to integrate that. I think for things like, um, uh, I think for things like, uh, kids with asthma or, or kids where are patients where the environmental situation is a profound part of their health condition that the integration of that data is 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 the the silver bullet the key to, to making so, progress so, so the age of personalization of fine-grained feedback yep yeah. yep okay. um, the thing I've probably been surprised about or the thing where I've had to make a, a a course adjustment along the way is you kind of come into this hoping you're going to take someone from point A to some point B that's radically different um, and having to adjust or understanding the power of small increments and how that can make a difference and how those multiply over time. So the interfaces that nudge you slightly to order slightly healthier are the systems that help the diabetic be a little bit more uh, you know, today's a little bit better than the day before, I think is uh, uh, a change. It wasn't, I certainly would have never thought of my research agenda that way when I started. Um, and then the last part, and this gets to, I don't think she's here, we were talking about effective computing and stuff. Uh, this whole notion about identity presentation, it's, it's 
in your face when you're working with adolescents, but it's actually part and parcel of all the health technologies that we've worked with. Um, we worked with, we took that same diabetes app and we gave it, because we were there, we gave it to the support group that worked in the same center, and these were folks who had had diabetes for 10 years or more. And we, literally, Lena did it, I told her not to, but she's stubborn, she didn't listen to her advisor, she did it anyway. Because I thought, I mean, why would these people need an, an app for diabetes management? They got it under control. They used it more. And the reason they used it more was it wasn't about problem solving. They used it as a reflection tool to actually talk through what it meant being diabetic. And they would talk through kind of the up. So for them, you know, use the app when diabetes rears at its head. It was much more about the experience of being diabetic than it was about the problem solving about being diabetic. And they found that compelling, as I said, to even use it more than the group where it had been kind of clinically meaningful. So in everything that we've seen, people's inter interaction with these technologies is part of socially who they are and how they make sense of the world as a person. And you know, conveniently enough, people don't just think of themselves as having a disease. You know, they think of who they are and everything that's part and parcel with that. And so whether we've intended it or not, the uh, systems that we've designed have played directly into that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.